he lives in the homes he lives in. There's not even the biggest rock stars in the world don't have homes like that. Okay. So with, I'm happy with what I have. I'm okay. I'm healthy. You know, I have a nice place. I got some money in the bank. You know, I got no complaints. There's a lot of guys that were a lot more famous than me. They're, they're have nothing. What does it mean to you personally now that this film is out for the world to see it? What does it mean to you personally? It's just, it's, you know what? It's, it's starting to connect with me. I mean, one, it's, it, it's an honor. I mean, you know, at this point in my life to have an actual feature film about my life with these just incredible characters through the movie. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's almost like a dream come true. It's, it's, and it's nothing I actually seeked out. I mean, they, you know, they came to me and I said, wow, okay. And, and it's interesting because I'm by far not the most famous person in the world, far from it. Like, the, like it says, the most famous, unfamous, famous person in Hollywood, right? So, I mean, so it's just very touching and just really wonderful. And, and, and what makes it more interesting, Dave, is the reaction I'm getting from other people. People just seem to, like, love this movie. I, you know, and I guess, I guess it's honest. You know, we were as honest as we could be. And uh, it's been a crazy journey for sure. Yeah. And I was going to ask that about you because you're very honest. You put your entire life out there uh, for people to see uh, fascinating stories, people that you've worked with. You know, were, was there anything, though, that you held back? Or were you like, if we're going to do this, I get the impression that you went into it saying, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. And I'm going to tell my entire story. Am I right with that assessment? Yeah, I, I would say so to the most part. Yeah, I mean... Uh... Uh, you know, there's a limited amount of time. Uh, what was real important to me was uh, getting my bandmates from the 60s because that's where it started. You know, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's easy if all of a sudden you're famous and you can talk, oh, Frank's great. Oh, you talk. But the thing is, you want to talk to guys that when you're 15 years old, when your mother was still driving you to a gig in the station wagon. I mean, that's that's the formative. That's what that's what my career is. That's what started it. And that's what made it really fantastic for me and you know kind of my late mom and it was kind of cool i mean you know and and the funny thing is i've lost five people in this movie and i haven't seen it since any of them passed so that's gonna be kind of interesting to you know see what's happened to that maybe i'll just sit in the back or something you know that might be a little uh, melancholy i think you say but i mean I, I i'm really happy i'm really proud of the whole team you know uh visionary Derek, David, Brandon, all these people, because, you know, I couldn't have done, I, I couldn't have done it myself at all. I mean, I, I'm, I, that's, that's not my strong suit, you know, and uh, yeah, but I mean, I'm just really, I'm really proud of what they did. And I'm really proud that people, you know, thought that much of me to, to do a movie of me. So it's kind of Well, cool. I'll, I'll say this, three platinum albums, two gold albums, five gold singles, Actually, 10 gold albums. I'm sorry, I have the wrong number there in front of me. But where did music begin for you? And then, of course, we're going to talk about the huge single that, that actually played a big part of my life that I'm going to share with you in a minute. But where did music start for you, Frank? I, I honestly, I, I know the exact moment. I know exactly. And I mentioned in the movie, it was on a Sunday, my, you know, my immigrant family was over our house on a Sunday and I remember there was a dining room table and they're all there talking you know Italians loud you know that's and then next to it was like they used to have these things in the old days where they had a radio and a record player and a TV, TV is like this big right and I remember just climbing up when they were six years old or five and a half years old putting a record on I'd never done that before putting the needle down and it was this old Italian song, E Combari. And I didn't know what the hell it was. I didn't know, I couldn't speak Italian, you know? And I just started singing along. And then all of a sudden I just kept singing all day. And the people, ah, Luca Frank is singing. And I, and it was maybe in a weird way, maybe it was some form of acceptance. I don't know, but I knew it, it just, I could do it. And then, this is about 1955, and then Elvis came out. And I remember when we went to my Aunt Nancy's house, 
on Missouri Avenue, Washington, D.C. And everyone was there gathering around. Let's see this Elvis Presley. It's a CD guy. And he came on, and I was sitting there with my cousin Eddie and a few of the kids. They were young. He's 19. And he came on, and I went, oh, my God. I said, that's it, man. I'm done. I said, this is absolutely the coolest thing I've ever seen. Even at six years old, I got it. I said, this is, there's no one like this guy. And at that point, I wanted to be Elvis Presley. And, you know, I, then my mother got us a ukulele. My brother and I broke them over each other's head, so I didn't get to use that. But that was what I wanted to do. If there was a broom or whatever. Come on, Frank, imitate Elvis. And I'm the earth, like very much. But I was like a kid, a goofy little kid, you know. And 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 then that was it, man. And that that was it. I did not deter. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to be. I didn't say I wanted to be a fireman, which all these are honorable jobs. You know, most kids. Oh, I want to be a cop. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a tree trimmer or whatever. I didn't want to do it. That's what I wanted to do. And then when the Beatles came out, it was over. That was it. Done. My mother said, we've lost them forever. It's it. <laughs> when I saw the Beatles, that, that's it, man. Done. Between Elvis, the Beatles, and Sinatra, that was it. Bingo. All right. I want to expand uh, some of our, our conversation now. Um, yeah. Some of the names you've worked with, Frank. Uh, uh, Richie Sambora. Mm-hmm. By the way, these are not our mutual friends. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, right, I, I met right, Richie right. once at a radio show, but I, I can't really think to call him a friend. But yeah. Bruce Springsteen, again, who I've, I've never met, but Daryl Hall, John Oates. But there is a mutual friend that we have, and I spent an evening with this guy at Dantana's, and I know you know that restaurant in Hollywood. Yes, I do. Um, Don Rickles. And oh, he's open for, open for him like 10, 15 times. That's, that's what I wanted to ask about. I mean... Talk about some of those memories because in, in your movie, and again, no spoilers here, but you know, you worked with John Oates, uh, you know. Oh, uh, we were in a band together. Right. Yeah. So tell me, tell me let's, let's start with John Oates for a minute. Tell me about well, him. I was, I was in a, a band. Uh, this was the second version of Valentine. The first one broke up. That started in 68. So 1970, I was before that, I was doing like kind of acoustic solo thing after the band broke up, you know. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to put another band together. So I, put, I, got the, I got some of the members from the first band. And then, but we didn't have a lead guitar player. So we auditioned a few people. And the guy goes, hey, man, I had this friend of mine, the bass player said, that John Oates, he's really good. You know, I said, great. So he came into the audition, you know, and he's a tiny guy. He's like about five, 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 four. And he had this Les Paul special, a real one, a TV model. And like a super reverb map. And I said, well, he's cool right away. He hasn't even played, but he's got that gear. And he was just the nicest guy. And he was really good. And he was real talented. And he could play good. And he could write good. And he could sing good. And a really nice guy. Really cool guy. And we, and we got along great. And we uh, had that band for a while. And then, remember, we were a bunch of clunky kids. You know, basically got barely got out of high school. You know, he was went to Temple University with Daryl. So he said, well, you know, man, I'm, I'm, he's graduating. So he goes, I'm, I'm like most guys in those days, I'm going to hitchhike all through Europe. Well, there went the band and then started my solo career again. But I mean, to be expected, I mean, Daryl was going to be in my group. They went like this. We were, it was 1968, the first Valentine. They said, uh, I said, man, it'd be great if we get a keyboard player. How about Gary? Now nah, he's off somewhere. He goes, friend another guy hey man I know this guy named Daryl Hall he's a really good looking guy really, really great singer I said great so we're playing in the, I mean when I think this basement where we rehearsed in couldn't have been more than 10 by 15 it's amazing in the cellar you know and this guy comes coming down the steps tall handsome really good looking guy and he sits there the whole time listening to the band I go, wow man and he goes, uh, I said, man, so what do you think? He goes, oh, you guys are great, man. You're good material. I love it. He goes, but here's the deal. I'm getting married and I need like a real gig. We didn't make any money. <laughs> we wrote our own songs. We, we, we played coffee houses for what, donuts. We making money. He was like in a real band that was making money. Like they had cars, you know what I mean? And we, you know, so he was like in a show band, you know, and he was making real money. We were still living under our parents. Yeah, we didn't make any money, you know, so that kind of went the wayside, but we did get a keyboard player, but that was so cool about that time, you know, 
just like, yeah. Th thanks for sharing that. All right, I have to jump to the big uh, question that I okay. immediately when you when I when I was going to talk with you, I was like, I have got to ask him this question because yeah. I used to jam far from over constantly. In oh, fact, God. it's back on my playlist right now since I oh. knew I was talking with you. I've been jamming it nonstop. Oh, when wow. did you realize how big that song was? <laughs> I can tell you, I mean, I we recorded it. Uh, I, I, it was already in Staying Alive. The movie had not come out yet. And I was going to, again, this is before the movie came out. It was like, oh, God, when was it? It was hot out, California. I had a date with this girl. I'll leave nameless, but she worked for one of the most powerful agents in rock and roll. Powerful. Really powerful, right? So it was a date, you know, just so. And I went to this function, it was a CBS function. I mean, it was, you name it, they were there. Stevie Nicks, Mike McDonald, Don Henley, a huge thing, right? So we're driving there. It all of a sudden, Far From Over comes over on the radio. And I'm sitting there, she was pretty savvy. I mean, she was a big shot in business and it was a date and she goes, are you ready, prepared? I go, for what? He goes, she goes, that's a hit record. You know that? I go, no, it's the first time I've heard on a radio. She goes, be prepared. It's a hit record. And I went to the party that night, unknown, and then eventually became a huge hit record. And it was like something, you know, it's really interesting. You know, you start at 1965 and 15 years old, failure after failure. I mean, like kids, you know, we do demos, then we did Take You Back and Rocky. Then I had a Joni Mitchell song I did with Harry Nilsson kid. And just, you know, now I'm like 32 years old and I go, oh my God, I've invested almost 19 years into the thing and nothing's happening to all of a sudden have a hit record and all of a sudden be part of a big movie, uh, get Grammy, Golden Globe. It was usually in the old days, your career was over at 32. Thank God I wasn't a teen idol, you know? And, and, and it kind of started and it's, uh, that's why people go, are you tired of playing a song? I said, no, that song saved my life, changed my whole my life, kidding? I yeah. am so happy you said that. I love hearing that. That song, uh, again, I will tell you right now has just, I've just, I've started jamming it again because it's just a powerful anthem. I think as people are in this, you know, quarantine mode and they're working out at home or wherever, I think it's a perfect song to put on your headset. And that's what I was thinking about the other day that it's a, it's a motivating song. And, and um, I'm so glad that, uh, that well, it was self-explanatory. I mean, because remember when I wrote that my career was over, but I said, no, it's far from over. I'm still back in it. I'm doing it. And I, you know, everyone takes, I'm reading Eric Carmen's document, uh, autobiography. It's really good. The guy from the raspberries. It's really, it's like his book and Springsteen's book. They all parallel. We all parallel each other's lives. We're all like the same groups, the kinks, the Beatles, the stones. Blah, 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 blah. It's kind of interesting. Play crappy bars, same thing. But Jimmy Webb was a good friend of mine. And I think Jimmy Webb is one of the great, great writers. And I always loved the break in MacArthur's park. So if you think, if you listen to far from over, Ba, 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 ba. like MacArthur's Park. This is the end. Ba, 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 ba. So I love that beat. And it was so weird and different. And Far From Over is actually long for a single. But, you know, with the help of the Scotty Brothers and Polygram, they, 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 they banged it out there, man. Are you talking about Jimmy Webb that worked with Glenn Campbell? Yes. The one that wrote By the Time I Got the Phoenix, MacArthur's Park, Galveston. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, I spent some time with Glenn the first, the last year when he was touring. Uh, and John, who my, our producer there that you see as well, yeah. we're actually, and I just spoke with him the other day, we're very good friends with Cal, Glenn's son, Cal mm -hmm. Campbell. Oh. And, uh, but yeah, I, when you said Jimmy Webb, I'm like, no way. Oh, yeah. Wow. It's very really interesting. Uh, well, first of all, Glenn was one of the greats. I mean, no matter what, he never, I never heard him sing off key, ever. And he was just a superb guitar and a nice guy. I did a gig with him in Arizona. Oh, in the, I forget my kid, probably in the 90s. He was a lovely guy. But the funny thing is, uh, Harry Nilsson, who I idolized, who I thought was just brilliant, we were going to the Roxy to see Jimmy Webb. And I'd met Jimmy many times because Harry and Jimmy were real tight, you know. And uh, they used to break each other's balls all the time. Who wrote better songs? I go, yeah. 
any given day. I mean, I remember them both sitting at a piano playing each other's songs. I'm going, are you crazy? Or how about this one? I mean, <laughs> by the time they get to Phoenix, uh, how about this one? Up, up and away on oh, my beautiful balloon. I'm going, wait a second. These are like the greatest songs. And they're just sitting there like breaking each other's chops, right? So I went to go see Jimmy Webb at the Roxy. And Harry was going to come. And I was going to sit right next to Harry. And he, and he didn't show up. And they said, uh, you know, he's not feeling good. He went to the dentist. And the next day we found out he died. But we were all going to sit there at that, at that, at that show and uh, Harry was some boy. He was. He said, "I had two hit records, and they both won Grammys." <laughs> That's incredible. yeah. And he was a great songwriter and a great friend too. I know they're going to give me the rap here in a minute. I could talk to you for hours, my friend. But uh, there's something you do in the movie that, that if you'll oblige us, you you do a great impersonation of your brother and John Travolta. <laughs> and I just well, yeah. well, that was that was the meeting of of John hearing my songs because. Every, you know, Bee Gees had kind of walked off the movie and I'd written all these songs and they were all rejected. Every one of them was rejected. And then I got a call from my brother. My brother, I can always tell where it's going by the greeting when he calls me. It was, I said, okay, something I did wrong or something. We're good. Hey, brother, how are you? I said, now you want something. He goes, uh, you remember those songs you wrote? In the stand? Of course I remember them. No, I forgot them like in two weeks. Oh, it took me like eight months to write them. He goes, yeah, we got a problem over there. You know, it's, uh, you know, Bee Gees are not doing the movie. I said, right, okay. So, and John's feeling pretty down. I go, oh, John's feeling down? You mean in his $3 million rental? And I'm like in a cubby hole, broke, no career, but John's feeling bad. I go, I'm feeling pretty bad too. He goes, well, listen, we're gonna do it. They said, we're gonna meet John at lunch and, uh, Give me a cassette of those songs, but don't tell them it's you. I said, okay, whatever. So I go over to John's house and John's there with this long face. Everyone's depressed and uh, they start talking. And I'm like, kind of, I have a sixth sense of humor. I'm saying, God, this is like Rocky meets Barbarino, you know, from Welcome Back, Cotter. And so, yeah, you know, John, we got problems. You know, yeah, I swear to God. Yeah. Just And we're eating. So he puts the music on. Like we didn't have it. There was no sound system for that. It was just like one of those Sony kind of 1981 boom boxes. Whoops. What happened? You're good. Oh, okay. Something. I think I lost your picture. What happened? There? No, you're good. I see you. Oh, you do. Okay. I can hear you. Vinny Barbarino. Okay, so, so anyway, so they're doing that. So John hears all the music and he's like really into it you know he's like really into it he's watching the whole thing and then he goes i love it this is what i'm looking for and i almost had a heart attack wow i mean i went like this i almost like choked on my shit all right so (laughs) so he goes oh but sly the thing this is what i love about my brother he tells me he goes there's some music i found i said you didn't find it i gave it to you (laughs) but but, you know i said whatever so at the end, so John goes, who is that, man? That's great. Who is that? And he points to me. He goes, that's Frankie. And John goes, that's Frankie? Like, I'm like Fredo from Godfather 1. You know what I mean? So it's like, I go, well, yeah, I, I do some stuff like that. And then after that, it was a blessing from God. And, man, the rest was history. It was just awesome. Well, and Frank. I, and I I've, thank everyone every day for it. Well, I, I, I don't want to get in trouble because, again, I just love this conversation. Um, I, the guy, a friend of ours, I don't know if you know him, Joey Bats. He works with Nick Vallelonga. Uh, oh, I know. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, he just texted me because I told him earlier I was talking to him. I looked down and I saw Joey is, is texting me right now. But uh, I, I knew the Scotty Brothers. I used to work at Power 106 Radio years ago. I'm Morales. I was the afternoon guy. Uh, but Where I'm back was home. that? Where was that? Out. That was, uh, it was, would have been the mid to late 90s. And I, uh, you, I knew Fred Scotty Jr., Ben Scotty. Oh, yeah. I knew yeah. all and those Tony. guys. Yeah, yeah. Their studio they in my... Santa Monica. Yeah, 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 no, Ben's the best. I still see him. You know, Frank, we're here. And I went on tour with him. He never went on tour with anybody. He went with me, and it was like magical mystery tour. Man, he was just classic Ben. He was so imposing and scary. No wonder my record was a hit. Yeah, listen, you have played this record, see? You know what I'm saying? 
So it was just really awesome. And uh, I thank God every day. I mean, the thing is, I've had my ups and downs like everyone has. But you know what? Knock on wood, I'm healthy. And uh, let's hope this new year is better. And I'm so excited for people to see this see this movie because this is the first time I've ever had any say so. Everyone else been telling my story but me. So it's, it's kind of nice. And I, got, I like that Stratocaster with the big head in the back. I see that. Oh, yeah. That one right there. Thanks, yeah. man. It's signed by Maroon 5 and Switchfoot. They're good That's friends like of ours 70s, as well. That's like a 70s, late 60s strap with the big headstock. Oh, yeah. The most famous part. You've met so many people. You've worked with incredible names, as I mentioned earlier. But who do you think, Frank Stallone, who is the most famous person you have met? And you, you can't mention your brother. <laughs> Frank Sinatra. Really? Can you yeah. tell us about that? Yeah. I mean, I met him a few times. Uh, we had the same manager I did for like a few minutes, Elliot Weissman. And I was at the Hollywood Bowl on a date and Frank was there playing. And at the end of the show, he announced my name. He goes, is Frankie Stallone out there? I stood up and I was with a date that was not happening at all. I said, how screwed up is this? Under the stars with Sinatra with a piece of driftwood. No, just nothing going on at all. And he says, hey, I heard your new album with Billy May, kid, knock my socks off. And he took a shot. Now the girl thinks I'm like the coolest thing in the world, but I'm done. So all these other girls are coming around. Oh, can I have your autograph? So I sent her home in a cab. That was a good night. So I met Frank on a few occasions. And yeah, I'd say that 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 was a big one. Paul McCartney was a big one. You know, wow. Ringo, George, you know, I met them through Harry Nilsson. But, you know, it, it's. You would never think in your life you'd meet them. But now when you're older, it's a little different effect. You know what I mean? Right. But I'd say probably Frank Sinatra. Harry Nilsson, by the way, a big part of, uh, I know the Campbell family talks, uh, Cal, Glenn's son, who I'm very yeah, close yeah. with, talks about Harry a lot. And uh, I love the fact that you are paying tribute to him in the, in the movie as well, your, your documentary yeah. that's out right now. I love that you did that. That was so yeah. cool. All right. Uh, another person that you talk about uh, in, in your film is somebody you worked with, Bill Conti. Oh, yeah. Uh, as, you can, as you know, I'm a former radio <laughs> guy. So of yeah. course, I ask music. I love, I'm, I'm drawn into the music stuff. Um, the, the, you know, Bill Conti, of course, composed the theme to Rocky, Karate yes. Kid, won an Oscar for the right stuff. Tell me a little bit about Bill Conti, working with him. What, what, was, he, what was he like well, to work with? I didn't get to work with him on Rocky One because I did Take You Back. There was no orchestration. I did get to work with him on Rocky three. Cause I wrote a song pushing it and other stuff. First of all, he should have won the Oscar for Rocky. I thought it was a brilliant mm -hmm. soundtrack. Going to fly now was two number one records by two different artists in the same year. You know, I mean, yeah. so he, he absolutely Bill is a wonderful person. He's really talented and uh, as good as anyone out there ever been. And, and I like him a lot. Great. Okay, so I have to ask about your boxing, uh, yeah. and then I promise you, I'm gonna leave you with the publicist. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, the boxing. Look, you were boxing before Rocky. You, you, you beat Geraldo Rivera in a match, which I think is hilarious. Yeah. Um, but it seems like boxing is a big deal in your family. But again, you were boxing before Rocky, and it, it's also shown in your documentary. How, so am I right when I said, I mean, it's a big deal in your family. It's a big deal in my family. I mean, if you could see, I have like a boxing museum in my house. I got stuff going back to John L. Sullivan. There's just something about it that is so pure, different with MMA, because going back to the people that were the down and outers, like the Damon Runyon characters, those were the fighters, not rich kids. Immigrants, people came to this country with no education to said, you know, trying to feed their family during the turn of the century, during the depression. You know, it's like in the movies. Yeah, I'm going to buy a house for my mother and stuff like that because their mother toiled as a housekeeper and these guys made it. You know, it's like Requiem for a Heavyweight or Champion or Rocky and stuff like that. And there's something about the characteristics of guys that really go into battle that's different, you know. Football players, you got 11 guys out there, baseball players. You know, it's, it's just a different thing. But when's mano a mano? And that's why the Latinos, that's why the Mexicans and the South Americans dominate in the lighter weights because they come from really poor countries. And, you know, it means a lot to them. You know, La Familia, their family, and they, they want to provide. You know, now you got the Russians fighting, the Armenians fight. But it's never like the guy going to Princeton. He's not becoming the fighter. 
It's going to be the, th and that's why I love about. I love the stories. I love the backstories about boxing. That's why I'm kind of attracted to it. So that leads me, and this will be my final question. Yeah. Um, what, tell me about the first time you saw Rocky. I was mesmerized. That famous picture in my documentary of my brother standing outside the movie theater, where, by the way, he was an usher in that movie theater years before. He was an usher there and got fired. So we got fired from a few places. And, uh, that I, and that was the last picture of him being anonymous or me, but at a different level. And we went in, the weird thing is this, and I'll just say in closing how strange things can be. It's on Third Avenue and 60th, Baronet Court, big thing tonight, Rocky. So we went that afternoon and they had us showing of the movie that afternoon and i'm sitting there with my brother next to him in our bad polyester suits as you saw in the picture big lapels horrible anyway and as the movie people are starting to walk out like a lot of people are walking out of the theater and there's this look on my brother's face it, it was just i'll never forget it was just like like this like all the the blood came out of his face and i went oh my god because you know even though he was like a young guy but still he put so much into this and people were walking out okay switch to maybe six hours later that night you could hear cheers from inside the theater on third avenue and that was it and when i saw it of course i had tears my because it's a great story i mean you know it's and I was proud of him. And I thought it was just wonderful, man. And I just, man, it's so sad. So I'm a fan. So people think, oh, he probably doesn't like his brother. I said, no, 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 no. I don't like certain things that happened to me. He didn't do it. But I adore my brother. I thought, I think he's one of the best talents out there. I mean, so that whole thing about like, oh, I bet you. I said, look, man, look, he lives in the homes he lives in. There's not even the biggest rock stars in the world don't have homes like that. Okay. So with, I'm happy with what I have. I'm okay. I'm healthy. You know, I have a nice place. I got some money in the bank. You know, I got no complaints. There's a lot of guys that were a lot more famous than me. They're, they're had nothing, but that's because I never got married. So I saved my dough. See, there I you could, go. I could John have been. And I, in John and I actually met your brother at, we were at the Creed premiere in Philly a couple of years ago. Oh. Of year. Yeah. We cover entertainment for Fox. And we were at the uh, at the premiere, and we've done Creed. We did Creed two. Excited about the upcoming. Well, he got movie. ripped off in Creed. I got in a lot of trouble for that online. I don't care. He should have <laughs> won the Oscar for Creed. I agree. Uh, and he it's... got ripped off, and and you know people go, you shouldn't say that. I said, well, I, I can't help myself. He's my brother, and he should have won. And everyone in that theater knew he should have won. Even the people he was up against. When I'm a voting Creed. member. I voted for your brother. Yeah, and, thank you. Um, so I, well, when I, that decision came down, even the people that he was up against went like, huh? I mean, they were all rooting for him. Because remember, they're all younger. So they all grew up on Rocky and Rambo. So it was kind of like the old guy finally getting his just due. 